This episode of the Nurse Practitioner Podcast is sponsored by Dakins. When you're treating persistent, hard to heal, or complex wounds, you need a solution you can trust, like Dakins Wound Cleanser. Just how powerful is it? Dakins Wound Cleanser has been proven to kill even highly resistant bacteria, like MRSA and VRE, within only 30 seconds. It's non-cytotoxic, shelf-stable for two years, and more cost-effective than other wound cleanser brands. When you need a solution you can count on, ask for Dakins. In this episode of the Nurse Practitioner Podcast, Sylvia Hastinen discusses Nurse Practitioner Full Practice Authority. Thanks for joining us today, Sylvia. Can you provide an overview of Greater Good Health? Thanks for having me, Taylor. At Greater Good Health, we are building a medical group and virtual platform for nurse practitioners to thrive in primary care. Our goal is really to expand primary care access to more people who need it by empowering nurse practitioners and preparing them to take on patient panel responsibility as primary care providers. What is your background and why did you decide to start Greater Good Health? Well, I spent all of my career in healthcare and the last 20 years in provider services, basically supporting the nation's largest medical groups, which employed thousands of physicians, nurse practitioners, and other health healthcare clinicians. I have almost exclusively worked in primary care as well. And so I had front row seats and firsthand experience with um, what it's like to manage patients in practices. I've spent some time building and innovating care models that brought care into the home and thinking about how to build the best types of clinical programs to manage patients outside the four walls of a practice. And, you know, back in 2007, you know, when virtual and telehealth tools weren't widely available and we were still plugging in scales into the patient's dial-up phone hookup, it was challenging. But in my latest role, running clinical strategy for one of the largest groups in the nation, my team studies the primary care shortage, the use of APPs, and specifically the scope of practice transforming nurse practitioners. And why I started Greater Good Health was really because of what I witnessed all those years and especially what happened during the pandemic. COVID really spotlighted the very apparent health disparities and access issues, especially in underserved populations, not getting the care that they needed when they needed it. I think these issues will just continue to worsen with the physician shortage and intensified burnout issues that remain prevalent across the industry at large. And so we're investing in nurse practitioners because we think that they are uniquely positioned uh, to help solve some of the strain the system has because of this shortage and because of the burnout issues. Why is the role of NP so important and how has it changed over time? Yeah, you know, nurse practitioners have been working alongside physicians in primary care practices for decades, and they've been doing many of the same things physicians have been doing, accessing, uh, diagnosing, coding, and prescribing for patients. I think the current care model has nurse practitioners augmenting and supporting physicians to grow physicians' patients' panels as large as possible. That's the only way it's really going to work with the current regulations and legislation is in areas where we don't have full practice authority. What's happening is we're just trying to leverage up, you know, a physician as much as possible and panel as many patients to that physician as best as possible. And we do that by bringing nurse practitioners and physician assistants and other uh, clinicians to wrap around as part of that care team. I think what we're seeing is an evolution of that because of the primary care shortage. You know, the pipeline is just really drying up in primary care for physicians. They just aren't choosing internal medicine and family practice specialties as they're graduating. They're instead choosing maybe more lucrative professional paths. And we're estimated to see a shortfall of, you know, 140,000 PCPs by 2033. And states are, are starting to evolve and transform legislation to allow nurse practitioners to practice at the top of their license. And in those full practice authority states where NPs can practice independently, we can panel patients directly to nurse practitioners, thereby opening up access for patients to get more appointments, better access in communities where maybe physicians aren't going to, and allowing nurse practitioners to do what they do best, which is manage patients' care plans and really thrive in primary care. 
Has the scope of the NP profession changed? There were some things listed that weren't directly related to full practice authority, but, you know, that allowed NPs in restricted states to do more without the oversight and approval of physicians. And many of those things were lifted during COVID. I think there's still that lift because it ain't over yet. Um, <laughs> but I but I don't imagine that, I think that the trend we're seeing is, is that states are moving more towards opening up scope of practice versus closing it off. We do see some states are moving a little slower uh, than others, but for the most part, I think we're going to be moving towards nurse practitioners doing more, and it's staying that way even post-pandemic and post-emergency response. What are some other ways the current physician shortage and the pandemic has affected primary care physicians and MPs? The shortage of primary care physicians is is really real, and, and the burnout issue also. You know, we're seeing a lot of physicians are almost half of physicians report that they're burnt out. I mean, the same of nurse practitioners. And a lot of them are retiring earlier than expected because of COVID. You know, the reasons why PCPs are not choosing, I'm sorry, why physicians are not choosing primary care out of school is because, you know, primary care physicians, I think, are offered comparatively low incomes relative to the high burden of educational debt and heavy patient care responsibilities you know, without sometimes feeling like they have the time and resources to fully engage with those patients. And our payment models really need to reform to commensurate with the level of engagement required of primary care providers. And so what we're starting to see in the industry, which I'm sure you guys are looking at and studying, is value-based care contracting really addresses these issues. And so we're seeing this migration from volume to value and more accountable care arrangements, which would allow primary care providers to do more and get paid for more of that work. But until that really does evolve, we're going to still see that physicians are going to choose other specialties out of school. And uh, I think the second reason why we're not seeing a lot of primary care physicians is because of the administrative burden that surrounds primary care. We stack initiative on top of initiative, all with the right intentions, you know, patient experience, quality, closing gaps, accurate coding documentation, building care plans, filling out advanced directives. But all these needs are really difficult to solve for in 15 minutes, you know, every couple months, especially for really complex patients. And so I think the administrative burden and the comparative, you know, income for physicians really drives many of those physicians coming out of school with lots of debt to choose other specialties. And so we're seeing this this really big shortfall of primary care providers. And then, of course, there's the rising patient population, the baby boomers who are getting sicker and older every day and aging into Medicare. And many of these Medicare insurance plans require those patients to choose a primary care provider. And we just won't have enough primary care providers to go around What I think is going to happen, very obviously, is that in those underserved communities and maybe rural areas, we're going to see patients, you know, not have access to the care that they need. And wait times and and appointment times are just going to be uh, prolonged for more months out and or they're just not going to get the access they need and crash into the hospital, which is not what we want to see. Do you expect telehealth services to continue post-pandemic? I do. I think the pandemic really almost pushed the healthcare industry to transform technology faster than it had been moving, which is a good thing because we're behind, right? And it moved consumers, healthcare consumers and patients to really look into using technology to gain access, you know, when it's appropriate over telehealth. So I I do think that telehealth is here to stay. With the older population, however, Medicare age over 65, those patients tend to have really complex chronic conditions and lots of medications. It's not just their medical needs, but also sometimes their lifestyle and environmental concerns that we need to address and social concerns. And in those cases, we have found that those elderly, really vulnerable patients really still seek care from in-person, in-clinic visits. And so we didn't see as much of an uptick with telehealth in that population. But I think in the general commercial population, so you and I who get our insurance from our employers, I absolutely think that telehealth is here to stay. It's more convenient at 
the right level of care. It's, it's appropriate. It's cost effective. And what has happened is the industry has moved towards investing in more innovative technical tools for us to use on our, on our phones and on our devices at home. And so I think that it's a good movement for us and will help with cost reduction. And, you know, the, the key here is really accessing the right care at the right time in the right way and in the right location. And I think adding telehealth as one of those options is a great way for us to sort of help solve the overburden of costs in healthcare. What are the benefits of allowing full practice authority for NPs? Well, allowing nurse practitioners to practice um, independently and uh, with, with full practice will allow them to panel patients directly from health plans and manage those patients as the accountable primary care provider. And what that will do is open up more access to patients, more appointments, more providers for them to choose from. They'll get more choice. And then I think also the type of care from a nurse practitioner is going to feel different than from a physician. Nurse practitioners obviously go through nursing school. And I, having gone through nursing school, know that, you know, it's just a different perspective. And we learn to not just, you know, the physicians learn to diagnose a condition and to prescribe a medication. We learn how to teach the patient to actually take the medication, right? So we're implementing those plans and thinking about how that patient's going to take it with, you know, a meal and how many times a day, how to organize their medication regimen. And as we migrate from volume to value and these payment models start to include more outcomes-oriented incentives, and we're going to focus more on making sure patients are taking that medication and actually bettering their health condition versus the volume, which is, you know, they see me once or twice or three times and I get paid for that. I think as we move more towards that value-based care orientation in our payment models, the incentives will change and it'll actually require us to focus more on some of the things we learned in nursing school and what NPs can bring to the table. That whole person care, a holistic approach, really thinking about the patient's outcomes and how they're going to live their lives in a healthier way. And, you know, we have a long way to go. The industry is migrating that way and has been for the last decade or so. But I think that NPs are well positioned and with full practice authority, it'll just elevate them to a level where they can take on more leadership and responsibility of these patients in those types of payment models. What makes the Greater Good Health platform and approach so innovative? Well, we are we really believe in nurse practitioners and empowering NPs and building primary care where NPs are leading. In in my doctor's practice, my primary care practice where I access care. There are four physicians, I believe, and one nurse practitioner. I think we're going to live in a world, you know, five years from now where it's going to be mostly nurse practitioners leading in a primary care setting, and the physicians are going to be elevated to a different, a different level, you know, in oversight and maybe with more complex cases. And I think that's going to happen because there are a few things driving that, the shortage, burnout, and the rise in, in, in interest in the NP profession and in family practice specifically with NPs. And why Greater Good Health Platform is unique is because we are really focused around that value-based care orientation, teaching nurse practitioners how to practice within that type of payment model. And we're investing a ton in wellness, burnout prevention, technology, a digital community, career fulfillment, and building a community and culture where nurse practitioners feel that they can thrive and practice to the top of their license. And I think coming from a world where, you know, for the past two decades, I've worked for very physician-oriented groups and have watched as NP turned over, sometimes at the rate of 30% or more. You know, 30% of nurse practitioners at the last company I worked at turned over every single year. And that's costly to the system. It's also not fulfilling for a nurse practitioner. We also meet a ton of nurse practitioners who come to us with six 1099s, you know, part-time work here and there. And, and at Greater Good Health, we W-2 and fully em- employ our nurse practitioners to encapsulate them in our, in our model and our platform. 
And I think it just offers sort of a different option for the NPs where uh, they are central to our business model. And it's different from what exists out there today, which is uh, just a much more physician-centric orientation. And I think, again, as the payment models change, as NPs start to panel patients, we're going to see probably more of this migration eventually, but we are first out to build this type of platform for NPs. Overall, how is Greater Good Health improving healthcare equity and accessibility? Nurse practitioners tend to want to practice in areas where physicians may be shy away from, and that would be in underserved communities, in rural areas, also in patients' home um, versus just in a clinic or practice or hospital, and over telehealth. And so I think the multimodality and the optionality for nurse practitioners opens up a ton of access for our patients, depending on where they live and also how they like to access care. And NPs also are a pretty diverse population of healthcare clinicians and represent more fully what the patients look like that they serve. I also want you to know that 80 to 90% of nurse practitioners are women. And I think that that diversity also helps to encourage women in the healthcare professional fields to achieve more leadership responsibility with patients and in their careers. What barriers do you foresee in achieving this mission? I think there are a few um, barriers that we'll have to overcome. Um, one is, is that the market in general and in, in the healthcare industry hasn't seen something like this yet. You know, most primary care practices are started by physicians. Health plans are used to paneling patients to physicians as the leaders in those practices. And so there'll be a shift in thinking. We are working with some national health plans who have really innovative and open minds about this and understand that the shortage issue is really putting a lot of pressure on them to diversify the workforce. And they know, and we support with lots of metrics and studies that show that NPs do operate at that same level and actually can be more cost efficient with the care um, for those patients and provide, in some cases, better patient experience and more value to their patient populations. I think there's a mindset shift that needs to happen within the healthcare industry. I also think with consumers, with patients, there's going to need to be some education and evolution around the thinking of receiving care from a physician and is just the same as receiving care from a nurse practitioner. And that'll be a conversation that we are happy to lead and advocate for. But I think those two shifts are, are barriers, not that we couldn't overcome, but uh, things that I think will need to evolve in the future as we continue to grow. What can we expect from Greater Good Health moving forward? Well, today, Greater Good Health is mostly on the West Coast. We plan to expand further across the U.S. with our partners. We are also hoping to partner with large health plans to put down practices that are NP-led and NP-centric. And we hope to be a household name for nurse practitioners, that they graduate from school, know who we are, and we're, you know, their first choice and come and stay with us for the longevity of their careers. What message does Greater Good Health aim to share with current and aspiring NPs? I think NPs have been the heroes in healthcare and maybe overlooked and undervalued over the last couple of decades. And we would like to shift that for nurse practitioners and empower them to do what they went to school for, what they what they are passionate about, and that is providing the best care, the most complete whole person care to all the patients in the United States. Thanks for listening, everyone. You can find Greater Good Health on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. You can also find the Nurse Practitioner Journal on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Please also be sure to give the podcast a reading if you liked today's episode. Thanks for listening. This podcast does not constitute medical advice and should not be taken as such, and does not replace professional judgment or advice. The ideas and viewpoints expressed in this podcast do not reflect the official position of the speakers, authors, affiliated organizations, the Nurse Practitioner Journal, 
or Walters Kluwer. Please note that the hosts of the Nurse Practitioner Podcast are not clinicians. However, we created the Nurse Practitioner Podcast to bring you relevant clinical information by NPs for NPs. Thanks for listening.